The local church is at the heart of what God is doing in the world. That means that the people of God in a particular location or community are the means by which God makes his mercy, his grace, his love, his compassion, and his very presence known in that community. It's how the people living there would know who God is and what he's like. And when you read through the New Testament, it's churches that launch and plant and establish other churches. This is how God intends for it to be. And this is why we're passionately committed at Chapel Street Church to becoming a family of neighborhood churches. We made the strategic decision not to build one large campus in one location and hope that people drive from farther away, but to reproduce ourselves in communities and in neighborhoods so that the people living there would know the presence of God. And that's why we're so excited to talk about our fourth campus opportunity. God has given us the place in North Aurora, and God has preparing a people with Pastor Andrew Griffiths and his team as he's assembling to launch this coming fall. And God has also given us the opportunity to make this happen financially. Recently, a very generous private donor has come and said that they would like to commit to matching 50% of the balance of this project, which is $1.1 million. So if we, as a church family, can give $550,000 to $600,000 this person will match that $600,000 and we can launch this campus completely debt-free. What a great opportunity God has given us. What better investment could you think of than to invest in the expansion of God's kingdom by expanding the local church, the way that God makes his presence known in a community. I'm asking everyone who calls Chapel Street Church their home, whether or not you attend the North Aurora campus, would you prayerfully consider what contribution you could make above and beyond your regular giving so that we could launch this campus debt-free this fall. And here's how you can do that. Simply indicate in your check, should you write a check, Neighborhood Church Multiplication. Or if you give online digitally, simply select Neighborhood Church Multiplication as your giving destination. And we'll celebrate together what God does in our midst as we launch the next campus for His glory and for the sake of His gospel. Thank you for being part of the Chapel Street Church family. Wow, you know, that guy seems to know what he's talking about, doesn't he? Uh, all kidding aside, we're glad that you're with us, tuning in online, joining us on our website, our YouTube channel, or our Facebook page. Uh, and this is who we are at Chapel Street, a family of neighborhood churches. As God gives us the opportunity, reproducing ourselves in communities and neighborhoods for the sake of his gospel. So whether you attend our online campus right now, or whether you are watching online, but you regularly attend one of our in-person campuses, we're glad you're part of the church family, and we encourage you to pray with us for what God is doing in our midst. Today's Palm Sunday. That means this week is coming up as Holy Week. Next week, of course, is Easter Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection. We encourage you to tune in online and worship from the comfort of your own home. Invite a friend by sharing the link. And if you live in the area, we'd love to see you in person. We have space for you at any of our campuses and our services. You can find out all that information online. Come celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ with us next week. Let's bow and pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we're so grateful for the way that you love us. We confess that we often forget, we doubt, we lose sight of that, we're discouraged, distracted, and sometimes we're just stubborn and go our own way. So right now in this moment, would you slow our minds and hearts down, prepare us to hear what you have to say to us, because we want to hear from you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, today is Palm Sunday. Uh, it's named for the palm branches. Perhaps you grew up in Sunday school or going to church or you've been, you've seen the kids waving the branches and you know it's Palm Sunday, uh, commemorating the time when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem amidst the shouts and cheers of the crowds. It marks the beginning of what we call Holy Week or Passion Week, the most significant week in the Christian year certainly the most significant week in the earthly life of Jesus himself, all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, spend a significant amount of time dealing with the events of the last days of Jesus on earth, the last week. Two-fifths of Matthew's gospel, three-fifths of Mark's gospel, a third of Luke's, and half of John's gospel are devoted to the, the events of the last days of Jesus on earth. It's significant for a reason. I want to encourage you this week, 
to set aside some time to read the gospel accounts of that last week. In fact, if you're uh, new to doing this, you can tune in on our Facebook page uh, and on my Instagram page. We'll have a daily de video devotions looking at the last week of Jesus for Holy Week devotions. You can join us that way. But set aside some time, however you choose to do it, to focus your mind and heart on who Jesus is and what he's done as you prepare to worship him on Easter. So we're in uh, a, a little mini-series this week and next week, taking a break from our series in 1 Peter to look at Jesus, we're calling the unexpected king. Jesus the king that nobody would have asked for or expected, but Jesus the king we all desperately need if we understand him correctly. And each of the four gospel writers give an account of Jesus entering Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. We call it the triumphal entry. Many of you heard this story before and you presume to know what it's all about. Yeah, yeah, Jesus comes in, palm branches, people cheering, I get it. But this, there's a Sunday school version of this story, which you grew up hearing perhaps. There's also a more mature adult version of the story. What I mean by that is there's a version of the story that's subversive, radical, powerful, and speaks to you and your heart and mind right now if we let it. Jesus comes into focus in a new way when we realize the radical and shocking, uh, even subversive nature of this story. In John chapter 12, we're told that six days before Passover, uh, so that would be yesterday on Passover Sunday, Saturday, Jesus is entering into the city Jerusalem uh, at Bethany, from the town of Bethany where he stayed. So he's in the town of Bethany, and this is the same town, by the way, earlier in the Gospels when Jesus visited and raised a man named Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha. You might remember this story. And he raised Lazarus from the dead. And now Jesus stops in Bethany to, to visit again. He pauses before coming into Jerusalem on Sunday. And he has a dinner party, or they have a dinner party for him. Because I think it's a custom in any culture. If somebody raises you from the dead, the least you can do is throw them a dinner party. Sort of a thank you for raising me from the dead, Jesus, dinner party. Jesus stays there. The next day, Sunday, Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem. Now, what I want us to see is that Jesus times out his arrival and everything he does very, very specifically and intentionally. Let's read Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it uh, here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Okay, powerful story there. Jesus makes his way into Jerusalem on Passover week. It's Passover week. This is a significant time of the year for the Jewish people. The most significant time. Jerusalem as a city would swell to two or three times its normal size, from somewhere between 80 and 100,000 to 200 to 300, maybe even large, close to 400,000 people in the city of Jerusalem for Passover, visiting from all around the region. So there's just swarms of people, not only in the city, but in the villages outside of it, including Bethany. And as you read through the gospel accounts, you realize everything Jesus does is 100% thought out and intentional. It's the culmination of his entire earthly ministry that's happening right here in this moment. He pauses, we're told, at the Mount of Olives. So I'm gonna show you an image here of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. 
Uh, actually, this, this, this is the Mount of Olives. We're looking from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. I'm standing, I took this picture myself, standing on the Temple Mount, looking across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. It's not really a mount, is it? It's more of a hillside. You can see the olive groves and trees there. The next image is me standing on that same mount you just saw, looking back the other direction from where I took the first picture, looking at Jerusalem, the Temple that's the, the, the Dome of the Rock today, but that big wall there is the Temple Mount. So that's the vision Jesus would have had, the scene he would have had as he looked across the Kidron Valley from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem as he heads in. He tells his disciples where they can find a colt of a young donkey tied up. That's pretty intentional. He's thought this out. He tells them to bring it to him. And he even tells them like the password to say if somebody asks him. Because somebody might ask, hey, what are you, why are you taking my, my donkey? That's my, my donkey. Where are you going? And they say, the Lord has need of it. I, when I first read this, it sounds like a Jedi mind trick, doesn't it? The Lord has need of it. These are not the droids you're looking for. Like he's just saying something, okay, you could have my donkey. But actually, people are excited about Jesus. The whole region is buzzing about him. So it would have been a privilege to have Jesus ride your donkey into town. So when he says, the Lord has need of it, this guy probably thought, sweet great, you can have it. They bring it to him. He's not going to walk into Jerusalem as he has before. This time he's going to ride in. That's also very intentional and very significant. He's taking the same route that King David and King Solomon would have taken when they rode into the city. And this also is intentional. He's saying something about who he is by his very actions. In the ancient world, kings and conquerors rode into the cities they conquered on a giant war horse. I remember reading years ago Tom Holland's book, Rubicon, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic. Caesar famously crossing the Rubicon River, leading the Roman legions back into Rome. It had never happened before that Caesar led his own army against the capital city. And so when a, when a conquering king entered the city he had conquered, he rode a war horse with all of its armor and banners of war. But when a king returned to his own home, capital city, he would often ride on a colt or a smaller horse that wasn't decked out for war as a sign of his benevolence and the, the returning home. Jesus picks up on that theme and rides on the colt of a donkey. So he's riding in as a king, but not as a conquering warrior. It's interesting. This means he is the paradoxical king. This is the first thing we see of Jesus. He does things that are intentional, but don't immediately make sense. He's riding, but not on a war horse, on a young donkey. In verse 11 of Luke 19, we didn't read this, but it's, we're told that he proceeds to tell the crowd a parable as he was near Jerusalem. And they suppose that for that reason, the kingdom of God was near. They think the king is coming. The kingdom is arriving. The whole city's buzzing. People were expecting something to happen. But Jesus is not what anyone expected. He did not come as a conquering military hero. He did not come uh, to throw out the Roman soldiers. If he had, he would have marched straight to the fortress of Antonia, where the Roman garrison was. That's not what he does. Revelation chapter 19 tells us that he will return one day, and he will ride into the city on that day on a great white horse with blazing eyes of fire and a sword in his mouth. So he will come as a conquering king, but this time he comes as a humble king. In fact, this also is a fulfillment of prophecy. The Old Testament prophet Zechariah, writing to Israelites, the Jews living in exile, writes this in Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So Jesus in verse nine is coming humble on a donkey. In verse 10, he's returning in power. That ancient prophecy is talking about Jesus, two different arrivals. Here in Luke 19, we see the first arrival of Jesus, humble, riding on a donkey. He's fulfilling prophecy. In so many places in the Gospels, Jesus tells his disciples and those that he heals not to tell anyone. If you've read through the stories, you know he'll heal somebody and they're, they're jumping with joy. He'll say, 
don't tell anyone yet. My time has not come yet. Or when the disciples recognize who he is and call him the Christ, the Messiah, he, he says, not yet. Don't tweet, don't tweet about that yet. <laughs> it's not time for the world to know yet. Many times he does this. Specifically says, don't make this public yet. But here, on this day, in this moment, he's publicly declaring his identity. He's intentionally drawing attention to himself. Why? Because he knows his time has come. The people shout, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna means literally, God, save us now. <laughs> save us now, please. They're shouting, salvation, salvation has come. The king is here. The Pharisees hear this, and they try to get Jesus to, to make him shut up, to get him to be quiet. But Jesus seems to be forcing the issue of his identity. And I've been thinking about this. Sooner or later, for every one of us, we have to face the identity of Jesus. Sooner or later, the issue of who Jesus is meets you face to face. You can avoid it for a while, but eventually, eventually, in this life or in the next, you face who he is. The call is, will you face him now? Will you recognize him as king now because he has come? One more thing Jesus does that is oddly paradoxical. Let's look at verses 41 to 44. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. This phrase right here, the time of your visitation, literally means the time of God's arrival, of God's coming to you. If we can just go back one slide. We're told Jesus wept over it. He wept over the city. That word wept is, uh, doesn't mean like a, a single tear silently rolled down his cheek. That's not what it means. It, the word in Greek actually means loud wailing, loud mournful sobbing wailing. And the reason is because they did not see the things that make for peace. Now, they saw him as Savior, but not the kind of Savior he really was. They wanted military peace, civil peace. They didn't understand that he came to make peace between men and God, to deal with our sin. And he weeps, which is really kind of strange. Think about the image for a minute. Riding into the city, hundreds and hundreds of people lining the streets, waving branches, shouting, cheering, praising God for you. You come in the city, and then you weep. Not just privately cry a little bit with emotion. You start sobbing and wailing loudly. That's Jesus. It's strange. Why does he weep this way? Why shed these tears? Because he knows that those who cry Hosanna on Sunday, among them will be some who cry crucify him on Friday. Because he knows that those things that make for your peace, they missed the peace that he came to offer. In, in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, He himself is our peace, and he reconciles us to God in his body through the cross. Nobody saw that coming. And he weeps because he knows the cross is coming. He knows that before he'll sit on his throne, he'll hang on a Roman cross. So he weeps. And verse 44, he weeps because they, if we go to verse 44, they did not know the time of their visitation. They did not recognize that God was coming to them. And that gives me pause. Do you recognize the time of your visitation? Do I? Do you recognize that God has come to you? That he is coming to you? Or do we, does it sweep right by us? Really, verse 44 is a heartbreaking verse. Don't miss the moment of your visitation. Perhaps you've been around church your whole life. Maybe you've been going to services for a long time. Maybe you're brand new. Whatever the case, maybe this is the moment of God coming to you. Do you know who I am, he's saying. 
Do you recognize me as your king, the one who gave his life for you? The next thing we see about Jesus is he's the confrontational king. The confrontational king. Where's the first place Jesus goes after he enters the city? It's not the palace. That's where a king might go. It's not the fortress. That's where a a, a military general might go. Where is it? He goes straight to the temple. Let's look at verses 45 to 48. As he, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Jesus goes straight to the temple. Now, the first time Luke records Jesus coming to the temple is in Luke chapter 2. Jesus is 12 years old at this time. He's a boy. He's there for Passover, same time of year, for the Passover to celebrate God's deliverance of his people out of Egypt. And he's in the temple. Remember, this is a story where Mary and Joseph leave with the family caravan, and they forget Jesus. They leave him behind. And Mary's like, I thought you had him. Joseph's like, I thought you had him. I thought he was with his cousins. They go back to the city, a day's travel, and they search everywhere, finally finding the boy Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus, in the temple. And at that time, too, they're all hanging on his words. Jesus is teaching the scribes and the Pharisees as a 12-year-old, and they're stunned at his knowledge. And when Joseph says, hey, Jesus, what are you doing? Why have you treated us this way? Jesus says, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house and about my father's business? Well, here at the end of his life, he's in his father's house, the temple. And he's also about his father's business. Although it looks a little different this time. Think about this for a moment. Jesus goes after not the pagan Romans, but his own people. He drives out those who were selling money changers, those who were, who were swindling people, overcharging them, cheating them at the temple of all places. He drives out the, the temple traders, Jews, not Roman soldiers. You know, we're so quick to point the finger in our culture at, at problems in our government, and rightfully so, there are many or at problems in our secularized and immoral culture, and there are many. But I think we should pause and recognize that when God looks at a nation that is losing its way spiritually and morally, where does he point the finger? At his own people. That's where Jesus goes, to the heart of, of the religious and spiritual life of, his, of God's people, the temple. In Mark 11's version of this story, we're told Jesus flips over the tables, like he turns them over. We think of Jesus as maybe this sort of meek, a quiet, maybe timid little guy. That's not Jesus. He's flipping over tables, driving them out. They run from him. I'll tell you what, if you want to get somebody's attention, go into a restaurant, see somebody you know or that you don't know, walk up and just flip the table over. I'll guarantee you, everybody will be watching you and look what's wrong with this person. You might get arrested, so don't do that. But Jesus turns over the tables literally and figuratively. Why such a strong response from Jesus? Because the temple was the place that people went to meet with God. What was the temple for? It represented God's presence among his people. It was the place you went to worship him, to connect with God. And these money lenders and changers those who sold, are making it more difficult for people to come to God. You want to make God mad? Make it more difficult for people to come to him. God does not like it when we put up barriers to people coming to him. That's why Jesus reacted the way he did. God is not happy when we do things that prevent people from coming to the Father. And and that brings us to the church, us. We're meant to be a bridge by which people come to God, not a barrier that keeps them away. It breaks my heart when I hear stories about people that have grown up in churches that they felt, they felt like the church dismissed them, cast them aside, or was a barrier to their faith. I know there's all kinds of stories, and we've all got our stories, but God's vision, his heart, is that his people in the world should be the bridge by which others connect to him, not a barrier. 
In the New Testament, Jesus' harshest rebukes were reserved for religious leaders who weighed the people down with all these burdens of the law that they could not keep and thereby keeping them from understanding and receiving the grace of God. Interestingly, when Jesus drives out the, the, the sellers, those who sold, he also drives out what they sell, the animals for sacrifice, because Jesus knows that he himself will be the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And this brings us to the third thing we see about Jesus here in this text. He is the transformational king. He's paradoxical. He doesn't make sense. We wouldn't have chosen him. He does things that are strange but very intentional. He's confrontational. He comes to flip over the tables of sin and corruption, not just out there in the world, but in your own life, in my life. Jesus wants to turn over the tables of sin in your life if you'll let him. And this makes him the transformational king. He cleanses the temple in Jerusalem. And in 70 AD, the Roman emperor Titus will destroy the temple in Jerusalem, tear it down, stone by stone. Where is the temple today? Well, last week we talked about this. It's the church, it's God's people in the world. More specifically, it's every individual heart. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that if you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, your body, your very life is a temple in which God dwells by his spirit. How does Jesus cleanse the temple today? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's how he does it. He's still doing it, even today. This is what he meant when he said, the things that make for your peace, the cleansing of your heart, the forgiveness of your sin, the setting your soul free, and back in verse 30, we read, the, uh, Jesus says, to the young, uh, uh, says about the young colt, on which no one has ever sat. Did you catch that? You're going to find a young colt of a donkey that no one's not even ridden. They haven't even sat on it, which is a curious detail to include. How would you know by looking? Maybe it's the wild one kicking and bucking because no one's ever broken it to have a saddle or to have a burden placed on it. Any of you ever ride horses before? Ever tried to ride a horse? Have you been around horse people that break horses and watch it happen? I, I got bucked off a very tame horse once. <laughs> when, we, and I, and I, when I was a kid, my uncle living out in Montana had horses, and I remember trying to ride with him and uh, getting tossed off once or twice. Jesus rides this unbroken animal into town through a screaming crowd. Think about that for a minute. How would you expect an unbroken and unridden animal to react uh, when somebody gets on it and there's a crowd screaming? It's going to be a wild ride. <laughs> you might end up in the dirt. Here's what Charles Spurgeon writes about this. In the midst of this excited, cheering crowd, an unbroken animal remains totally calm under the hands of the one who also calmed the sea. This is not just an interesting detail. I think there's a very deep spiritual lesson here. When Jesus comes into control of your life, he doesn't break you the way we think of a horse being broken under the bit and bridle and saddle. He calms you. He liberates you. He restores you. Let me say that again. When Jesus is in control of your life, he doesn't break you. He restores you and liberates you. We tend to think of somebody in control of my life that's not me as that's uh, invasive. It's controlling and I don't want to be controlled. It's uh, somehow it dehumanizes me or it limits me. And that would be true of anyone and anything other than Jesus. You put your career in control of your life. You put your family in control of your life. You put this cultural moment in control of your life. You put the pursuit of, of anything that you could think of, even good things, as the controlling force of your life, and it will break you. Only Jesus, the one who made you, the one who calmed the sea, can calm your soul and set you free when he takes the reins, as it were, of your life. That's what makes him the transformational king. He's the king your heart longs for. C.S. Lewis, in an essay called Present Concerns, writes this, where men are forbidden to honor a king, they will honor millionaires, athletes, or film stars instead, even famous prostitutes or gangsters. 
For spiritual nature, like bodily nature, will be served. Deny it food, and it will gobble poison. It's very profound. We're, we're, we're made to worship and honor a king. We're made to be under the rule and reign of someone, the right person. And when we're denied that, our true king, we'll look for someone else or something else, and that will ruin us. We'll gobble poison, as he says. But there is a true king who has come and will come again, under whose reign we're not broken and destroyed, we're set free. Notice also this place where Jesus says that the very stones will cry out. The Pharisees say, hey, Jesus, tell those people to be quiet. Jesus says, if they're silent, the stones will cry out. What's that about? What does he mean? Is that just a metaphor? Well, actually, Jesus is drawing on powerful Old Testament references here. Look at Isaiah 55, verse 12. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Or, or a, a Psalm 96. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Over and over again we see these references to mountains, trees, hills, rocks, stones, rivers, all creation singing, breaking forth into song, dancing, clapping their hands before the Lord. This sounds almost Tolkien-esque. If you read any of the Tolkien's uh, Middle Earth, the trees moving, and, and, or, or, for, or perhaps even better, when Aslan is on the move into Narnia, Narnia, the, the land begins to wake up. Even the trees begin to talk and sing again. What is Jesus saying here? Is he, does he literally mean that? Here's what he's saying. Apart from Jesus, nothing is the way it's supposed to be. Not creation, not you, not me. Nothing is right apart from Jesus. Outside of his rule and reign, things are broken and don't work right. Apostle, the Apostle Paul in Romans 8 talks about this. He says, all creation is groaning to be set right. It's groaning under sin and corruption and decay. Because it knows something isn't right. It longs for the king. And we long as well. We groan inwardly, Paul says. So if nothing is right apart from the king, when the true king returns, when the true king comes into this land and into your heart, he sets things right. So here's the question. If rocks and trees and hillsides will sing and clap and dance when Jesus returns? Under his reign, what will you do? What will I do? What are we meant for if stones cry out, if trees sing? What are you meant for when the true king comes into your heart to reign in your life? The ruling power of Jesus Christ transforms you. He is the only one in the universe who can take the reins of your life and not break you, but liberate you and set you free. We call it the triumphal entry this Palm Sunday because Jesus enters in triumph. But the triumph is not what anybody saw coming. It's a triumph that would lead him to the cross where he would give his life hanging on a Roman cross, dying for your sin and for mine. We'll celebrate that at our Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday services this week. But that very sacrificial death is the things that make for your peace, as Jesus said. He's the king that gives his life for you. All other kings say, your life for me. All political leaders, all of you for me. Only Jesus says, my life for all of you. He's the paradoxical king that nobody expects. He's the confrontational king that comes right to the center of your heart. And he's the transformational king that can set you free. Let's pray together and then we'll worship as we close with a song. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your transformational power in our, in our world and in our lives. God, forgive us for resisting your rule and reign. And I know there are some listening now, God, and this is the moment of their visitation. This is the moment when you have co are coming to them, speaking to their hearts right now, whispering to them that you don't want to break them, you want to set them free. 
that you would whisper words of grace and peace into their soul and they would hear you and they would surrender to you, the true king of our hearts, of this world, and of all the universe. We pray this in your name, our King Jesus. Amen.